This is Pamela Smythe from the University of Waterloo. I'm one of the hosts of Beyond the Bulletin, the podcast of internal communications at the university. We bring you news and views from the U Waterloo community. Please spread the word that we're on soundcloud.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And now the interview from episode 145 of Beyond the Bulletin, originally broadcast on November 18th, 2022. Daniel Scott, a professor in geography and environmental management, is just back from COP27 in Egypt. There, he launched a new international tourism panel on climate change. The global collaboration will support the tourism industry in reaching net zero emissions, while helping tourist destinations and the people and economies that rely on them be more climate resilient. Daniel, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. How much of an impact does tourism have on climate change when it comes to emissions? So we did the first estimate for the sector globally uh, for the United Nations World Tourism Organization about in 2007. At that time, it was roughly about 5%. There's been a newer estimate um, that's put that as high as 8%. Um, mm. So to put that in a little bit of context, if it's still in that sort of 5 6% range, that's the same as Canada, the UK, and France put together. If it's closer to the 8%, that puts it in third place. If it was a country behind only China and the United States, so that would actually be roughly the same size as India as a country. So it's certainly not a, not a trivial sector as part of global emissions. What is the goal of the Tourism Panel on Climate Change that you presented at COP27? Yeah, so the biggest goal is is to enable the sector, the tourism sector worldwide, to support the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement, and that's that's two ways: sort of accelerate um, the tourism's journey to to net zero emissions by 2050, and and to reduce their emissions by as much as 50 percent in the near term. So that's their goal for 2030. So we want to help um, accelerate that, and the other part is to help improve the climate resilience of destinations around the world, particularly in some parts of the world that, that really depend on tourism, um, but they're in highly vulnerable countries. Well, many of the small island developing states, some parts of Africa and Asia, um, they, they really depend on tourism for their economy, for jobs, um, and they're some of the most highly at risk uh, countries and destinations in the world. Oh, it really has more to do with infrastructure than people would think, you know, like they, you, you're relying on the power grid. How do you address those aspects? Yeah, no, that's a really good point, actually. And, and that was one of the points we made at COP in Egypt was that tourism is actually a part of many of the conversations that happen at COP from ecosystem protection to gender and livelihoods to infrastructure, as you said, adaptation at, at the community level. And so, but most people don't recognize how important a role it actually is um, in, in some parts of the world. And so that's part of our mission is to, to raise that profile, but also to build the capacity within the sector so that they can engage and, and contribute to those conversations better than they have so far. Because sometimes tourism is left out of those policy discussions. It may not be there or not be there in the same form. So it's, it's an important part of the conversation to have for sure. How was this presentation received at COP27? We've got really good feedback from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They, you know, part of our hope is, you know, we do the work and we support their writing teams. Um, and, and they love that we were going to be doing that work. They wished other sectors would do the same because it makes their job easier when they're doing the special reports. And they don't always have sectoral experts, for tourism or agriculture or something from, from different regions. So if, if the sectors, in this case tourism, can do the work, or at least some of it, uh, it makes their job a lot easier. So that was really well received from the sector, the business community as well. Um, they, they welcomed it with open arms as well. They, they know there needs to be capacity built and and there needs to be stronger connections between those doing the research and then the decision makers in the private sector and government who need the research. Well, the panel is made up of 60 experts from 30 countries from various sectors like academia and business. Why are you taking that approach? We've always argued, you know, climate change can't be solved in silos, whether it's at the University of Waterloo level, we need to work in a more of an interdisciplinary way and, and our our Waterloo Climate Institute is part of that solution to bring people from across campus together. And when you go up to the sector, it's the same same challenge. We've got fragmented expertise you know, in Canada, Europe, North America, the global south. 
and connecting those people together and importantly connecting them with the decision makers who who have questions who have information needs is our sort of main goal so connect the academic world together and then connect them better with the decision makers and government and business um, that need the information and how do you do that though so we'll be able to develop research teams that will work on on a stock take process which will be the first of its kind for tourism that looks at how indicators of impacts are changing over time as well as how are we making progress towards some of our, our goals in terms of reducing emissions um, reducing water in some you know arid and other areas that's a key part of bringing those working teams together remotely but we've also got some money to bring people together um, at some key events where we can actually do some of the brainstorming and working together they're already meeting at sort of the world travel market, for example, in Berlin or in London every year where those decision makers are there and we can work together, bring them into the room together with our research team. So that's part of our mission. But you can look at something from from an impact perspective. You could look at, well, what is the average season length for skiing, for example? Um, and you can see how that's changing over time in, in different parts of the world. Um, on the emissions side, we'll develop a new method that we we know the data exists and we'll be able to track emissions at a country level, similar to we have tourism satellite accounts that do that for the economic benefits of tourism. So we'll do that, the same sort of thing on estimates for, for emissions, things like water use. And we'll have those data that will be collected sometimes by others, sometimes by the tourism sector, but we'll be able to track those, you know, maybe every three years is, is our current goal, but eventually we might get to an annual tracking um, so that we can say, you know, are we actually making progress on some of the things we promised to do? You've actually done a lot of work and a lot of work in the media, so thank you for that, about climate change and winter tourism, and that includes winter sports like skiing and the future of the Winter Olympics. In fact, one study found that if global emissions of greenhouse gases are not dramatically reduced, only one of the 21 cities that have previously hosted the Winter Olympics would be able to reliably provide fair and safe conditions for snow sports like skiing, for instance, mm -hmm. by the end of the century. In your experience, how motivated is the tourism industry to take steps? We're actually speaking to the International Olympic Committee next week. Um, they have a future host committee that's made up of member countries and, and others. Um, and so we're presenting some of our results, newest results, directly to them and having a conversation with them of, well, what, what are their adaptation strategies? What can they do differently? Particularly one that will come up really immediately is the Paralympics because it's even at higher risk because it takes place in March. These messages are getting through there, taking into account the research that we've done, which is great to see. That's all we can hope for as an academic to, to help them move forward. On the sustainability side within the tourism industry, there too, I think the conversation has really changed in the last five or so years. For the longest time, sustainability writ large and emissions as part of that was really driven by corporate social responsibility reporting. So it was much more of a PR marketing kind of exercise for about 15 mm -hmm. years. Now, I think that conversation's really shifted that the industry sees it as a bottom line issue um, but also a social license to operate challenge. And so they're, they're really looking at starting to do things very differently. Everything from a sort of at a, a country level, like New Zealand as a, as a country from a tourism policy perspective is looking at, well, do we allow cruise ships to continue to come? What is the role of international aviation and international tourism in our future economy? Like they're asking big questions like that right down to corporate players um, who are doing amazing work um, in decarbonizing, reducing water footprints, um, and the list goes on, reducing plastics, like the, the whole range of sustainability. And they're doing so with, with you know, very open targets. So it's not sort of PR and, and greenwashing anymore. Like people can get in there and actually track what they're doing and see that they're, they're actually following up, which is great. Not every, even countries not, don't always do that, so. Well, I mean, it's one thing to have all of these experts get together and discuss, you know, what should be done, what's happening now, what could be done. It's how do you actually get it to the point where there are actually positive changes happening? Yeah. And, and widespread, like, you know, we speak to, you know, there are certainly leaders in every sector that are doing the type of work that I just talked about that, that are, you know, they're at the front of, of, a, of a sustainability wave. Um, but that's not everybody. 
then you get to the question well how do you how do you enable or how do you enforce um, the mm -hmm. same type of good cha good changes um, across the board so that you're making you know progress at a sector level and some of that will come at a regulatory level um, oh. we're, we're seeing some countries on the emissions as, as one example France has said there won't be flights of, of an hour anymore in their country so you will where there is a, a train or another option um, they just won't allow those flights to happen anymore. Um, so that would be the Toronto to Ottawa kind of route just wouldn't happen anymore. You'd have to take a train or an electric aircraft as those become available or drive it, hopefully with an mm. electric vehicle, et cetera. The markets are, are really coming to support climate change and they're, they're demanding, and very shortly that this will be mandatory, but uh, carbon and climate risk disclosure of, of publicly traded companies in the tourism sector and, and other sectors as well, where you would have to report your emissions and what you're doing about that. Um, and it would have to be transparent. It would be up to a certain standard that the stock market and investors could utilize that information. And the same they'll ask on your physical climate risk. How are you being impacted by, by heat, wildfire, flooding, the list goes on. And what are you doing to make your business more resilient, your supply chains more resilient and taking into account, you know, future climate change as well as part of that. And then how is that embedded in your corporate governance? These are all things that, that the SEC in the States, um, Canada is looking at these. So the guidance, mm -hmm. Europe, New Zealand, the guidance will be there. And probably within the next year to three years, um, most of those stock markets will have moved forward with that. And I think once one domino goes, then the rest of them will follow suit with very similar kind of guidance and including Japan and, and many other countries as well. It's not for a consumer perspective. So what the stock markets, which includes our pension fund, right? Mm. We're, we're putting money in like you would be surprised how exposed pension funds are to hotel properties, right? It, these aren't just big corporates that own these things. The pension and institutional investors are actually a big part of own big chunks of tourism that most people wouldn't know. Some are saying, well, there are corporate leaders that, that are reducing their climate risk and we're going to invest there as opposed to others that are way behind the curve. And this is the kind of information they need um, across the board to make those decisions. So that's, that's what that mandatory disclosure information requirements are for, not so much to help consumers make better decisions, although that is needed as well. What do you think is the branch of the tourism sector that needs to improve the most in terms of emissions? The toughest one, the toughest nut to crack is aviation. It's, it's the largest source, transportation writ large, and then aviation is the largest single um, source. Things like accommodations, if states, provinces, countries decarbonize their grid. So on Ontario, we're pretty much decarbonized now. Quebec already is, but a place like um, Saskatchewan or Alberta have a long way to go. If they decarbonize their grid, then all of the accommodations, all of the ski areas, all the other kinds of attractions, they benefit immediately. That is current policy that those grids will be cleaned. Um, so tourism will benefit. So that and new building standards, retrofit packages for all kinds of buildings, hotels will be part of that. So that'll mm. take care of itself. We don't have a good technological solution, one that is economic and scalable to replace um, aviation fuel um, with sustainable aviation fuels. Right now, sustainable aviation fuels are less than 1% of the global market. There's a real push to develop new types of sustainable aviation fuels. Some will come from biological or feedstocks, usually um, agricultural wastes, but that's a limited source as well. So synthetic fuels, where you use carbon capture out of the atmosphere and you can create everything from diesel to, to jet fuel. That is uh, the best solution that we see um, that requires a massive amount of renewable power to make that happen. Um, so there needs to be a huge investment in solar and wind just to produce that fuel to keep the aviation fleet or allow it to decarbonize. So that's mm. the sort of crux of and that shouldn't just be on the aviation sector to make that investment. The tourism destinations, countries, economies benefit from that. They too should be contributing to that. And and for places like small island developing states that where tourism can be 
50, even 75% of GDP and jobs. They need to be even use their voice even louder with countries like Canada, Europe, and the US and others to demand investment in that kind of technology because that's key to them being able to continue with tourism as an economic development strategy. So is it aviation just because of the fuel they use or does it have also to do with how many flights we take? Yeah, growth is certainly part of the, the challenge up until the pandemic, which you know really devastated the sector globally. Tourism was growing roughly at 5 to 6% a year versus the global economy in the sort of 3% range. So for 20, 25 years, tourism was growing you know, faster than the global economy. Um, and aviation was doing the same. Uh, Boeing and Airbus are developing hydrogen-based aircraft, mm -hmm. um, but they're very early in the sort of technology cycle. Part of what we've already looked at is, as part of the tourism panel on climate change is the 10 or 12, I think, we found different net zero roadmaps for aviation. They're all different. Some include large amounts of hydrogen, some none. Some have demand management, which means the sector can only be so big, so only so many passenger kilometers available, mm -hmm. um, which then raises other questions. How do you distribute that equitably? Is it a user pay system? Do you use climate justice principles and allocate at least some of those to, to small island developing states that would see their tourism sector devastated if they couldn't get people there by air? And those questions aren't even being asked right now. Um, and that's part of our role as a, as a panel of experts is to get those policy questions on the agenda now so that we can at least think about them because they're going to raise their ugly head in maybe it's five years, maybe it's 10 years, but certainly in the 2030s, we're going to have to face discuss, you know discussions like that. Yeah, we don't have a lot of time. No, well, that's the, the all of all of this decarbonization in, in every sector is has to, to ramp up very quickly. And, and decisions need to be made on, on different technologies, different fuel sources. And so, yeah, it'll be a very dynamic sector for the next 25 years. I, I keep reading about these gigantic cruise ships. What yeah. impact does that have? So if you go by emissions, cruise tourism is, is your worst choice. Um, and in part because, A, you fly to a destination for example, Miami, and you leave on the cruise from there, you return and you fly home. So there's the flight component. But a cruise ship, particularly some of the biggest ones that are being built, as you said now, they can have five, even 7,000 passengers on them. They are a small moving city that is entirely fueled by diesel generators. Um, some of them burn like heavy oil um, in, in their propulsion systems. Again, you know, not a clean, uh, certainly from a carbon perspective and even from an emission perspective. So that is one. And because they are so large, when they pull up to port, they can't even plug in to replace those diesel generators for their electricity because sm some many ports don't have the capacity to suddenly plug in a city of 5,000 people and their electricity needs in some of the small island developing states, they just don't have that capacity in their grids. So they continue to have to run their diesel engines even when they're in port. They are looking at hydrogen as, as a, the new sort of propulsion system. And they are looking at building the capacity in, in many of the ports so that they when, when they do show up, they can plug in. Now, some of those ports are continuing to run their electricity grid off diesel as well. Um, but presumably over time, in some of those islands, um, there is a lot of solar and wind potential. Um, mm -hmm. Those grids will be cleaned, and so that will be part of the solutions. And then once they decide on some of those fuel pathways, cruise ships, if they use the same fuel, will have to sort of plan, replan their routes as to where you could pick up the hydrogen or ammonia is another one they're exploring. I would think a lot of these countries in the global south, though, a lot of these tourism hotspots, they can't afford to make those kinds of upgrades. No, and and that's where what will probably happen is is the big shipping ports, the Shanghai's, the you know Vancouver's, etc. of the world, will get the new fuel first, um, and so the cruise ships, if they're going to go with the new fuel, would have to be you know maybe start or end in Vancouver somewhere where they can refuel in a Vancouver or another big. Some of the, you know, the traditional stops for tourism can still happen as long as they've got the fuel to get back to where they're, you know, where they can refuel with, with whether it's hydrogen or whatever the fuel of the future will be. In um, Norway, 
in their fjords because of the the emissions and the air quality problems that cruise ships have i think it's as of next year or 2025 those cruise ships with with diesel and heavy oil generator based in propulsion so won't be allowed in those and so electrified smaller cruise ships are in the development stages and they're being tested i've i've been on a on a ferry in sweden Shorter routing, but it was a good passenger experience the same way you didn't really notice any difference. The Maid of the Mist in Niagara Falls will be electric within, I think it's as of this summer, those will be entirely electric as well. Really? Oh. Yeah, so they've changed those over and you'll see the whole whole new branding. And I think it's as of this summer, both sides, everything will be electric down there. What's your priority for the panel? I see our, our biggest mission is is connecting the scientific community with decision makers and that knowledge mobilization. I think that that is something that often the knowledge there's been knowledge produced. It sits in academic journals and places like that technical reports, and it's not seen or translated into the language of decision makers. So I I see that as our principal goal is, is connecting these, these disparate communities so that knowledge can flow both ways. um, But also so that we know what are the priority knowledge needs um, for decision makers so that we can then spread that word back out to the academic community and say, look, this is the research agenda. This is what you need to prioritize it. As we talked about, we only have so much time. We, We can't keep guessing as to what people need. We need to hear from them. What do they need? And that's going to vary depending on what stakeholder it is, um, what region of the world you're in. But that's a big part of what we have to do. And then another goal that we have certainly is is to build capacity, um, research capacity in some parts of the world. I mentioned, you know, Africa, parts of Southeast Asia, um, South America, where tourism is a big part of the economy. And there's virtually nobody doing research in the sector in those regions. So we want to build capacity so that those regions themselves in the language that they need to work in, um, we'll have more capacity in there, there as well. And so that's, part, again, part of our mission, too. How do you do that? How do you build research capacity in other countries? So we've identified through through colleagues, you know, so who are some up-and-coming either postdocs or PhD students, so we're inviting them in um, so that they can participate remotely, hopefully, you know, engage in some of the research clusters or working groups that we have and that they'll be connected then to some of the world leading experts, even if it is only remotely to begin with. What other points would you like to make before we close today? I'm a geographer. I'm a, I'm a tourism scholar. Um, I want people to see the world. I want them to get, engage with people from around the world. Uh, you know, my, my own experience, it's, it's really difficult to dislike somebody when you've had dinner with them. And so if people, more people from different parts of the world get together which is what tourism facilitates, it creates that sort of better understanding around the world. So we absolutely want tourism to happen. We just want it to happen in a way that's the most sustainable and and the best for the host communities as possible. Part of that is not not traveling, but traveling differently, making the choices based on how where do you go, you know, if if New Zealand's on your bucket list. Rather than go back in two years or next year and see a little bit more and a little bit more, because each one of those journeys has a massive carbon footprint. You you have the same one carbon footprint, but you see everything there is to see um, that you wanted to see at once. So, and or you you pick destinations closer to home. There are many types of holidays, domestic holidays that we can have that are already you know net zero compatible. If you've got an electric vehicle and you go to Blue Mountain or Tremblant for skiing. You know, a completely hydroelectric power grid in, in Quebec is virtually carbon free. Your electrons to get there, your, your the ski lifts, the snowmaking is all net zero compatible. But much of the hotels, um, other than your sort of food and beverage, we'll still have to explore that, how to make that a little bit better. But so it can be done already today and it will only become easier and easier to make those decisions Unlike buying a car or a house or consumer electronics, you don't often have that that labeling of, you know, how much energy, how energy efficient, how much, what is the carbon footprint of holiday A versus B. And that's something we're really pushing the industry to do as well. Um, some early players like Google is starting to do that with flights. And if they can do that for flights writ largely, um, you know, the same should be done um, so that consumers can make that informed decision. What about carbon offsets, though? They range in quality 
unfortunately, what a lot of offsets are are, are basically junk um, that don't necessarily even reduce the emissions that some studies have shown. Um, others, you know, it's a lot of tree planting, some of which happens. We've had examples of where tree plantings in California have since gone up in smoke uh, because of drought and wildfires. So your carbon was re-released rather quickly. Um, so there are companies like Atmosphere, which is a, a German um, offset provider, does great work. They're heavily involved in, in the actual projects that they support. Um, they help create some of those, like they have solar farms in, in, in parts of sub-Saharan and in, in North Africa. Once you find a good company like Atmosphere, that's, that's one that I can highly recommend, and you know I'm going to stick with them. It's problem solved. It's that first step of finding, well, what is that reputable company? Um, and that's not always the easiest to sort out. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for doing this and for doing the important work that you do. Thank you so much for having me and help uh, inform people about how they can travel sustainably. Thank you for listening to this interview from the Beyond the Bulletin podcast from the University of Waterloo. You'll find our archive of full episodes on the University of Waterloo website and select interviews are on the university's YouTube channel. Just look for our playlist there. Please join Brandon, Sweet and me for new episodes on Fridays. And don't forget to tell your Waterloo connections about us.